Hey everyone, Andy Raphael from eTechnics.com and today marks the day that we've all kind of been waiting for, the 7th of the 7th, and obviously 7 nanometer. So let's do this. So today sees the launch of the new third generation Ryzen processors. Along with that, obviously we have the X570 chipset and also the GPUs, the 5700 and the 5700 XT. We do have video content and radio written content for kind of all that as well. So definitely go and check that out. Now, when it comes to the processors, we've all heard the facts and figures at Computex and at E3, we have 15% IPC uplift. There's new features, blah, 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 blah. But what does it all actually mean to you? Well, to start with, let's start by looking at the actual stack and kind of how it compares, price-wise at least, to Intel. So when we look at the whole stack, there are processors in the Ryzen 5 series, the Ryzen 7 series, and now even the new Ryzen 9 series. And there is actually gonna be a 3950X coming at a later date, probably around September time or so we're told. Now, when it comes to the two processors that we've got here today, the Ryzen 7 3700X priced at 329 US dollars as well as the Ryzen 9 3900X priced at $499, really sort of aiming at being competitive against that Core i9-9900K. Now, straight off the bat, I'm actually gonna tell you I'm really, really excited about this. Kind of feels like we're back to the good old days of AMD. If anyone remembers the mobile XP days and the Barton Core processors, they were absolutely amazing. They competed with Intel, they were either maybe just ever so not, you know, slightly under kind of Intel's performance or they were on par with Intel's performance or they were even better, but they were so much cheaper. And I think that's what we're actually gonna be looking at here without giving too much away, because obviously we will have benchmarks at the end of this video. Now, obviously they're based on the Zen 2 architecture, which is pretty damn scalable in the grand scheme of things. When you look at Ryzen 1st gen and Ryzen 2nd gen, now moving up to Ryzen 3rd gen with the Zen 2 architecture. Now, yes, they are seven nanometer. So this also tells us that this is the first set of seven nanometer processors on the market today. Now, I'm not expecting AMD to get everything right with kind of the first go. So who's to say that there aren't going to be better seven nanometer processors at a later date? If today's performance is anything to go by, seeing better than that is going to be absolutely amazing. Now at Computex as well as E3, AMD claim to have better power, better performance and better efficiency compared to their second gen parts and the Intel equivalents. I mean, yeah, rub it in, why don't you? But the problem is, whenever a brand sort of touts out all these facts and figures, you have to kind of take it with a pinch of salt. And I guess that's where we come in as reviewers to really sort of give you a good indication as to how these perform in real world tasks. AMD also claim that these are better for content creation, which is perfect for someone like me because I mean, you're watching a 4K video right now, that's technically classed as content creation. Anything that can save me time, as well as when you pair it against the 5700 XT graphics card, I think it's gonna be a win-win for content creators everywhere. Now, the other key thing to note about these is, being the fact that they use the AM4 socket means that they are backwards compatible as well. So you can use your second gen processors in the new X570 chipsets, but you can use these processors in the older chipsets. So B450, for instance, X470. Now that's a great thing because if you don't want to stump up the cash for the new X570 sort of base motherboards, which I will admit are a little bit more on the expensive side, and maybe you even have one of the B450 motherboards, yeah, or the X470. There's nothing stopping you upgrading your processor and still getting the extra cores, the extra performance, while maybe not getting some of the extra features that the X570 chipset actually gives you. Now, talking of features, there are some things that we get, such as extra USB, super speed Gen 2 ports, for instance. There's also PCI Express 4.0. Now, it is worth noting, Intel don't have this yet. So AMD are the first to market with PCI Express 4.0. That means that we're getting extra bandwidth, not just on uh, graphics cards, but NVMe drives, for instance. When we actually got our AMD kind of press kit, they did send over a Corsair MP600 drive. Now, we have done some tests on that, but we did have a few sort of hiccups, which I don't actually think is down to AMD. I think it's based down to the firmware on the drive. So we will actually do another feature based around that at a later date once we've kind of worked out all the kinks. Now, another thing that AMD have kind of done in collaboration with all of the brands out there is through the use of their new third generation Ryzen processors and the new X570 chipset is they've made overclocking a lot easier. So now when you actually go into your BIOS, you will see that there are new overclocking menus as well as new help menus. So, you know, when you normally go in there and you'll see 
uh, CPU V core and all it will say is you can adjust your CPU V core. Well, that's kind of changed now. It just gives you a little bit more detail, which is a nice thing that AMD have kind of worked with motherboard manufacturers to kind of make that happen. Now, another thing that's happened in kind of a little bit of a collaboration with AMD is they've worked with Microsoft on the Windows uh, 10 May 2019 update. Now, essentially what you'll see is a new way of, I guess, Microsoft Windows 10 kind of liaising with the processor and really sort of utilizing them cores. Back in the past, you used to be able to set your affinity and sort of off you go. So if you were doing something like Premiere or gaming, you could kind of put more power and more performance into certain cores. Now it's kind of all taken care for you. So again, it seems like AMD haven't just, you know, developed a hardware based product. They have kind of worked with developers and, and done something that I guess paints the big picture and really does give you the most extreme performance. Another key thing that they've done is working with memory manufacturers. So when it comes to the memory, I'll be honest, Ryzen first gen, it was pretty damn terrible. Even AMD have admitted themselves it was pretty damn terrible. Ryzen second gen was so much better. Ryzen third gen, it's bloody amazing. So on air, they've actually managed to get DDR4 up to 5100 megahertz. Wait until these are actually out and the hardcore LN2 overclockers get hold of them. What are we actually gonna see then? I'm guessing speeds that are just gonna really be up there, you know, with some of the speeds that we've seen when looking at benchmarking on LN2 and extreme conditions on the Intel platform. Now, other things when it comes down to the memory is the fact that the QVL now is so much better. So, so many more memory brands as well as different SKUs are actually on the QVL for all of the various boards supporting with these processors. And obviously a higher uh, stock speed that you can actually have these at. So when we got our kit, it came with a 3600 megahertz kit. The reason is it now supports 3600 megahertz and a lot of the boards which you can't see right now but i've got a stack of them down next to me all support speeds of up to sort of 4500 megahertz through just a few simple clicks of a button really really cool stuff again amd have been working with people to bring you this these kind of new functions, these new features, and these new technologies. And a lot of that comes down to the new memory controller design, which is on board the actual processors themselves. Now, the other thing that we need to look at is game cache. AMD have invented something called game cache. Sounds a bit like a buzzword to me, but essentially what it is, is they've doubled the L3 cache. So when we look at the specs of these processors, yeah, it has a lot more L3 cache, and that's perfect for gamers. It absolutely loves cache. So when we look at some of the charts that AMD have actually sort of put out during Computex, during E3, you can see that the kind of improved benefits of having that extra cache is uh, definitely paramount to gamers. It's just the fact that they've called it game cache. I mean, surely it is just an increased cache, no? Now, the other thing that I want to talk about before I even really sort of delve into the specs of these individual processors all comes down to Ryzen Master Utility. If you haven't used it, I can see why. I'm not a massive fan of sort of software overclocking, but it's got so much better. So with that, it has full DRAM timing control, it has precision boost overdrive, and full CPU power management. So you can change so many more features than you could before. Now, I've gone on probably for about 10 minutes now. Obviously, we are gonna try and edit this down so it's a lot shorter, and I haven't even touched on the specifications of these two processors. So let's go through that, starting with the Ryzen 7 3700X. Now we've all seen it before, but it is worth me sort of just touching over it lightly. We're looking at eight cores, 16 threads, operating at 3.6 gigahertz with a max boost of 4.4. 32 mega L3 cache or game cache and a 65 watt TDP. It does come with a Wraith Prism cooler with RGB now because as we know, RGB makes everything much, much better, right? It has 3200 megahertz memory support and is priced at, as I mentioned earlier, 329 US dollars. Now compared to the i9-9900K, that's priced at 494.99 currently for the same cores and threads. But yes, it does have a faster boost, but it's 95 watts. This is only 65 watts. Think of the possibilities, especially when you think the cooler that comes with it has a TDP larger than 65 watts. Hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. Now, when we look at the Ryzen 9 3900X, uh, it is the first Ryzen 9 processor. It has 12 cores and 24 threads and operates at 3.8 gigahertz. It has a 4.6 gigahertz max boost speed and 64 megabytes of L3 cache or game cache. It has 105 watt TDP and again comes with a Wraith Prism RGB CPU cooler. Same memory support at 3200 megahertz and it's priced at $499, so about the same price as the i9-9900K. But less cores, less threads, faster boost, lesser TDP. So you can kind of take from that what you will. Now, based on all that, uh, I want to talk about overclocking. So overclocking has been a tricky one for me. 
I think it's a dying art when it comes to the general consumer. Because looking at the clock speeds that I actually got on this, the Ryzen 7 3700X, I got up to 4.3 gigahertz. The Ryzen 9, the one with more cores, more threads, somehow I managed to get it up to 4.4 gigahertz. Both of these in between sort of 1.4 to 1.45 volts. SOC voltage had to be changed to about 1.2. Load line calibration, it didn't matter what I did with it, it didn't have really any effect. And well, you're seeing the results, what kind of, you know, overclock, extra performance we got from overclocking. So uh, I guess with that, let's run them benchmarks and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So now that the benchmarks are out of the way, you can see the results are, well, pretty astounding. Intel, I think you should be worried. They performed absolutely amazing. And I think for the most part, everyone's gonna want the 3900X, but everyone's going to buy the 3700X, or more importantly, the 3600X, which is gonna come in even cheaper. Yes, it's not gonna have the same amount of cores and threads and clock speed and boost speed, but I think for most people who are maybe looking at Intel or who are even on Intel at the moment and are looking to sort of move up, just think about what you get. You get a cheaper processor. Yes, if you want X570, you're gonna pay for it. You're gonna pay a little bit more money for more technology. I mean, that's simple. If you want a faster car, you're going to be expected to pay for it. If you want to buy a car that has more features, you're going to be expected to pay for it. So much like X570, you're getting PCIe Gen 4, you're getting extra USB, you're going to have to pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, then use X470 or B450. B450, you can currently get boards for, you know, under $150, probably even under $100 now. They're absolutely astronomical value. So the last thing I did want to touch on again is the overclocking. I've got a little expression that I love. The juice is not worth the squeeze. It's as simple as that. For the extra heat and the extra power draw and the extra noise, is it really worth getting a couple of hundred extra points in 3D Mark? Yes, if you're an enthusiast hardcore overclocker, I completely am with you. But AMD now have technologies that will do it all for you. We have Precision Boost Overdrive with automatic overclocking as well. So if your cooler allows it, if your power supply allows it, more importantly, if your motherboard allows it, if you have a 16 phase VRM motherboard, perfect. And there are some out there. We have got videos and everything of that as well. So check that out. Then yes, you are gonna get that extra performance for free. Who doesn't love free performance? But if you're trying to do manual overclocking, we've even found on all of the different boards that we've been using, they all kind of overclock the same. And that comes down to if you have a 16 phase VRM, a 14 phase, a 12 phase, 12 plus two plus whatever, doesn't really matter. I think, in all honesty, and I'm probably going to get flamed for this in the comments, and some people may actually agree with me, overclocking is a little bit of a dying art for the majority of people. Please, I want to make that clear. If you're an enthusiast overclocker, and we are hopefully going to actually do some stuff with LN2 with these in the very near future, then yes, I completely get it, it's for you. But for the bulk of people out there, it's just not worth it. Go into Ryzen Master Utility, enable PBO, enable automatic overclocking, let it do what it needs to do, because when you don't need that extra performance for rendering, content creation, gaming, it will just ramp back down and give you an efficient, low sounding, low power usage system, at least compared to Intel. So there you go. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hopefully you do sort of see where I'm going and my points behind it. Performance wise, these are absolutely amazing. I'm gonna be putting it into my next rig easily because, well, the equivalent to this really, as you saw from the benchmarks is, well, above an i9-9900K. So what are we talking, 9980XE? That's a 2000 pound processor. This is a 479 pound processor, $500 processor. Astronomical value for money. And I'm going to end it on one thing and just say, 
in all honesty, from someone who's been in, into computers since they were about 12 years old, and I'm 32 now, watching this video, I'm 32, my birthday was yesterday. AMD are back, and I'm so excited about it. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, let me know, and I will see you in the next one. See you later, guys. Bye-bye. Mind blown.